If you have your Bible this morning, turn with me to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And for the next uh, three Sundays, we will be uh, coming back and touching upon three, really the three major themes inside of Psalm 8, the nature of the universe, the nature of man, and then the nature of God. Um, the hymn that we just sang is pretty much a perfect reflection of Psalm 8 in this sense, especially. Um, that it is actually impossible to talk about the nature of the universe without talking almost primarily about God, which is nicely reflected in that psalm, right? That song, this is my father's world. You really can't understand the world at all unless you understand it in personal terms as God's world or as we say it as believers, our Father's world. That is very much exactly the perspective of Psalm 8, right? You can't talk about the universe properly without thinking of God. Exactly as in the hymn we just sang. Um, and so Psalm 8 uh, makes that very point and repeatedly uh, makes it. So let's stand together as we read uh, all nine verses of Psalm 8. We'll read the whole thing each week, and but we will come back and take various sections of it in isolation, and we'll take the opening section this morning. To the choir master, according to the Gatith, a Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, really upon the heavens, in the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we have already been singing to you this morning, just as the psalmist commands that we do. Sing to the Lord a new song because he does wonders and you have done wonders all around us, in us, through us. You have done wonders. Your right hand is the hand of salvation as is the arm of your holiness. And you have made known your salvation 
before the eyes of all the nations. And they ought to rejoice in your righteousness. And you have ultimately done that in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. His death on the cross, the ground for the forgiveness of sins that many in this room have clung to and leaned upon and hope in and have thereby received the forgiveness of sins. Lord, we do pause to praise you and thank you for your salvation. We ask as well that you would remember your loving kindness and your faithfulness to us. Lord, we so need your loving kindness. Quite a number of people in our congregation have been frightfully afflicted, wrestling with very serious physical maladies. And we plead that your loving kindness might come and touch, and heal, restore, encourage, grant perseverance and endurance through trial and trouble. Lord, we pray that you would remember your loving kindness to us and that you would show your loving kindness to all the ends of the earth. What a privilege it is, Lord, to come together as we have this morning and sing praises to your name, shout to your name, and urge all the earth to do that, to break forth, to shout, make melody with song, with instruments. We use piano and guitar and keyboard our own voices lifted up before you. And Lord, you have placed around us reminders of yourself all around us. We go out and see the oceans. We're told that the seas thunder in all of their fullness to show all those who dwell in the earth something of your majesties. That rivers clap their hands and mountains sing right through our eyes before you. You who ultimately have come to judge the earth. You who judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in uprightness. And Lord, under that judgment, we are reminded again of our desperate need to know and understand the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and meet us through Psalm 8 as we think about the nature of the world in which we live, how it praises your name and warns us of coming judgment each and every day. We ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. We've already indicated Psalm 8 is definitely a, a big picture psalm, right? The lyrics are pretty simple, not difficult to follow, uh, but they are, they're all sort of bent in a panoramic uh, manner so that as you read through Psalm 8, it, it just stands out to you that it is about uh, the nature of the universe. It is about the nature of man. It is about the nature of God. Uh, three of the most fundamental questions that anybody ever faces. Um, where are we? Uh, that's a question about the nature of the universe. Who are we? 
Now that's a question about the nature of man. And as we often put it popularly, well, why is there something rather than nothing? Well, because there is a self-existent God. That's about the nature of God. And though we are going to place them in the order of the nature of the universe, the nature of man, and the nature of God, you can't help noticing that in the psalm itself, it both opens and closes with God. Um, and, and, and not broadly or vaguely, but word for word. Uh, the opening statement of the psalm and the closing statement of the psalm are identical. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's how it opens. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's how it closes. In other words, you can't understand any of the big questions in life without understanding God as the key to answering all of the other big questions. The opening song that we sang, right, referred, made use of the little phrases in the book of Revelation, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Well, not very far from that is Revelation 1.17 which says this, and mirrors again Psalm 8 really nicely. Speaking of Jesus, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the first and the last. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's first, Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. That's last in Psalm 8. I am the first. I am also the last. What Jesus meant by that specifically, of course, I think is captured really straightforwardly by the Apostle Paul at the end of Romans 11, where he says, he wrote this, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be honor and glory forever and ever. You can't understand anything from God. It's all from him. He's the one sustaining it in the present. And he's the purpose of it all in the end. From him, through him, to him are all things. All begins with God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And it all ends with God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Everything is fundamentally God-related, God-dependent, has all of its central purposes grounded in, focused on God himself. And so I stated our thesis this morning this way, pretty simply. The nature of the universe is a heavily God-related question. The nature of the universe is a heavily God-related question. Uh, the opening little uh, section goes this way. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens, and out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes, to still the enemy 
and the Avenger. Now I put this question to those two verses. What is most ultimate? What is most ultimate? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Now in our culture, the answer to the question, what is most ultimate, is clearly given, unmistakably given, and, and God isn't in the picture at all. So if you watch nature-related programming on public TV, you listen to science-related things on public radio, if you pay attention at all to the textbooks on biology, public school, consider what is taught in the same departments in all of our major universities, what is ultimate is the universe itself, the big, impressive, gigantic accident that is the universe. Nobody summarized it better, which is why I quoted him again and again over the years, than Carl Sagan did for public television. His uh, public TV series uh, many years ago, The Cosmos, which opened with these words. And by cosmos, he simply means the universe, right? It's just a synonym for the universe. Here's what Sagan wrote. The cosmos is all that is or ever will be. Notice the language from Revelation chapter 1 that we sang in our first song. That's the language he's using. The cosmos is all that is or ever will be. Our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stir us. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as if in a distant memory of falling from a height. We know, we know that we are approaching the greatest of mysteries. Now, two things to note about um, Sagan's opening words. He understands what the, the question is perfectly well. What's most ultimate? And he's answering it clearly. The universe itself is the most ultimate thing. And David understands the question. What is most ultimate? And he answers it equally clearly. God is most ultimate. And God is the one who has placed his glory upon the heavens. Which is why the universe is so impressive. You set your glory above the heavens, the ESV has. Now that's, that's not really helpful because it tempts you to think that there's a heavens and then God's glory is somewhere above it. But that's not what he means. That's not what he means. What he means is what the NIV uh, translated. You have set your glory in, in the heavens. In the heavens. Or maybe even a little bit better than that, uh, the Hebrew Society's English translation of the Hebrew Bible called the Tanakh, uh, they translated it this way, and, and I do think that just sense-wise, this is probably the best of the major ones that I could find. You have covered the heavens with your splendor. You have covered the heavens with your splendor. That is, you've placed your glory 
upon the heavens everywhere. So they're just covered with it. They're covered with it. And so when you look at the heavens, there it is. So Sagan understands the question really, really well. What's most ultimate? And he says, it's the universe itself. And then David says, it's God. But then the, the really interesting thing happens to Carl Sagan. And surprisingly, he turns around and makes David's point for him in the opening words of that Cosmos series. Let me read it to you again. Our feeblest contemplations of the cosmos stir us. Let me translate that for you. Cause us to worship. Cause us to feel worshipful. There's a tingling in the spine, a catch in the voice, a faint sensation as of a distant memory of falling from a height. We know that we are approaching the greatest of Mysteries. All of a sudden, he's full of worship language. This atheist, filled with worship language. Well, he's just worshiping the creature rather than the creator. Yeah, but why? Because the stamp of the creator is unmistakably woven into the creation, and you can't miss it. Whether you're an atheist or a theist or whatever in between, the universe is designed to produce Sagan's response to it. And it inevitably produces it. As Paul put it, from him and through him and to him are all things to him. You can't miss it. You can't possibly miss it. God is most ultimate. And he reflects his ultimacy in the very nature of the universe, the very nature of the created order. Now, before we move on to the second point, just a, just a word about, you know, the... The odd verse there in the in the in the text, and uh, and we we sang a, a hymn together to reflect that verse. Uh, praise him, praise him, all ye little children. Uh, why we sang that together this morning is because the psalm says this: Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established praise. Um, during the centuries of the Enlightenment, it's been said over and over again. And of course, this is an older issue, because this is written 3,000 years ago not 100 years ago, not 200 years ago, not 300 years ago, but 3,000 years ago. But in our, our more secular times, in secularizing times, um, many people in the atheistic scientific world have said again and again, eventually we're going to stamp this whole religious business out. And we'll get rid of it. John Lennon, of course, put it really, really succinctly, you know, in 1970s song, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living life in peace there. That's, that's the Marxist vision. How wonderful it'll be when we're all dialectical materialists. And we're all safely in the bounds and in the arms of atheism, won't that be wonderful? But it never comes. The children are still singing. 
the children are still seen. Because God establishes praise. The kids can't, can't, can't miss it. They're capable of... Uh, another, the song that I actually uh, uh, thought of uh, as a kid that we sang when I was really little, little was it's, it's tricky because when, you, when you're so little uh, that you're seeing it, you usually don't know how to read or spell yet. Now, I still haven't learned how to spell all that well, but I, I can notice something like this. Uh, the little song, Heavenly Sunshine. But uh, so when it's, it's, it's a play on the words for kids, right? Because of the way you sing it, what are you thinking? You're thinking of sunshine, S-U-N, and how glorious sunshine is. But what the text of the song actually says is sunshine, S-O-N. S-O-N, right? So, heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, flooding my soul with glory divine. Heavenly sunshine, heavenly sunshine, hallelujah. And then the really key statement, Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine. Now, in New Testament thinking, this is really profound thing that's been woven in to this child's song, right? And by, by spelling it sunshine. The opening, think of the opening words of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made from him. All things were made by him. So the S-U-N sunshine is made to reflect the S-O-N sunshine. Oh, and by the way, as the kids sang it, and we know Jesus, we have him. Jesus is mine. God is mine. I have a relationship with the creator of all things. What a thing worth singing about. Little kids sing it. And it's true. It's true. Those who know Jesus of Lord and Savior know the creator of the universe and God himself, God himself, has established that praise. And on it goes. Against all the weighty, massive opposition intellectually, politically, and otherwise in the world. Till this day. Secondly, what is strikingly evident? What is strikingly evident? When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, what's strikingly evident? This thing was made that's what's evident. This universe was made. The work of your fingers. Somebody, somebody made this. Shirley and I were first married. There was a couple in Wonder Lake, Illinois that spent a lot of time with us really an embarrassing amount of time when I think through the first year of our marriage and um, uh, they're in their 80s they're in their 80s now and uh, Jim is a man's name Jim Warren and uh, and all the hours that we spent talking together I would say 80 percent of the time we were talking about the Bible uh, uh, Jim was a, uh, a middle school teacher at Parkland uh, Middle School in McHenry, Illinois, and um, a special ed teacher. Um, but he was uh, not only a very good theologian, but he was tremendously gifted as an artist and as a uh, working with with wood. If you uh, could see the some of the ducks that he's carved, so well, I've seen you know carved ducks. Well, you haven't seen them carved and painted on that level, but he has, unless you're in a really fine shop someplace, because that's the level. 
that he can produce when he really works on something. Now, what I'm, I'm going to hold up here, this he just recently uh, gave me this. You can't, you can't see it, so this is a really lousy illustration in one sense because you can't see it. But this is a sparrow. This is a sparrow, uh, and it's uh, painted like a sparrow, and then there's a little ladybug down here, and the sparrow is sitting on a piece of wood, and he's about to eat uh, the ladybug there. Uh, and then underneath it is uh, uh, mt.10 uh, colon 31, right? Which someone might take to be Matthew 10, 31. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Uh, fear not, therefore, for you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, right in front of that, what Jesus said was this, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. What's that mean? Why does he say that? Well, it's because when your life is falling apart, you're so prone to wonder, does God know what's going on? Does he notice? Does he care? Does it matter? To him at all. And Jesus says, Look, sparrows never die apart from your Father in heaven. Bad things never happen to sparrows apart from your Father in heaven. So be sure of this. Bad things never happen to you apart from your Father in heaven. He knows what's going on. He's watching your case. Uh, so that's the meaning of it all. Now back to our illustration. What's the chances that Jim didn't really carve this, but I just found it in the woods? It's just a block of wood uh, that happens to look like it's sort of painted like a sparrow, and look, uh, like a painted like a ladybug, and and there's etchings, there's there's marks in the wood that make it look like Matthew ten thirty one. So maybe I just found it in the woods. Now, if I told you that I just maybe found that in the woods, you would think that I am a moron. You would say, no, that is clearly made. That is clearly carved. That is clearly the work of somebody's fingers. It is clearly, clearly. But far more clearly, far more clearly, the universe around us is designed. It's a product. It's the work of somebody's fingers. You can't possibly miss it if you're at all being honest about it. You just can't miss it. When I look at your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you made, the works of your fingers. Here's how Paul put it in Romans 1, 19 and 20. What can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. In the things that have been made. In the works of his fingers. 
so that they are without excuse. The Roman Catholic uh, philosopher, I think he might be retired just recently, taught down in Texas. Uh, I've mentioned him before, a guy by the name of Jay Budashevsky, who writes uh, on these themes pretty uh, widely. And one of his book titles is, uh, is all about this. And he just titled the book, uh, What We Can't Not Know. What We Can't Not Know. Which is, and, and what he means by that is, you can't actually look at the universe and think that it's simply an explosion. You can't do it. It can't be done. Now, I've, d I've quoted from this material many times as well. This is an interaction in that, that Darwin is open to share in his autobiography. Um, interactions very late in his life with uh, friends around him and former students who are, who are asking him, because Darwin slowly and surely becomes an ever more and more consistent atheist, and his uh, theory of evolution becomes a, an atheistic theory from top to bottom, and him increasingly as the years go by, but not consistently. He's unable to be consistent about it. So he's an honest to admit things like this. He writes about, this is about six years before he dies, this one. I may say that the impossibility of conceiving that this grand, wondrous universe with our conscious selves arose through chance you can't conceive it that way, seems to be the chief argument for the existence of God. But then, then arises the doubt. Can the mind of a man, which has, as I fully believe, been developed from the mind of the lowest animals, be trusted when it draws such grand conclusions. Now think about this, what he's saying. He said, so I, yes, I admit it. When I look up at the heavens, I, I think that was made, intelligently made, but then I remember, ah, but my mind is the chance product of an evolutionary process. So you can't trust it. But which mind was he using when he put together the theory of evolution? Right? So this is where you get the D minus in philosophy. That's, right, that's absurd. Yes, it is. What's he doing? Paul tells us what he's doing. Suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and hiding from the evidence to the very best of his ability. The year he died, the year he died, a friend of his, um, the bishop or the Duke of Argyle, came to him and challenged him with this. It seems to me to be impossible to look upon all the contri contrivances of nature without seeing that they were the effect and the expression of a mind, Duke of Argyle says. In other words, they were made, made by a genius mind. It seems impossible not to see that, to say that. To which Darwin responded with this. He said, well, that often comes over me with overwhelming force. That often comes over me with an overwhelming force. 
And then he adds this. But at other times, it seems to go away. Which is really a way of saying, yes, when I actually think about it, it comes over me with an overwhelming force. But I'm able to put it out of my mind eventually and not think about it at all. Whoa. Whoa. The moon and the stars and all, God's woven them into the heavens. You can't, you can't miss them. You can't miss them. It's evident. It's evident to everybody. Thirdly and finally, what is, what is confirmed by the scripture? What is confirmed by the scripture? I draw that from that last little phrase, which you have set in place. Which you have set in place. David uses that kind of language, which you have set in place. Because he's familiar with the Genesis account of the creation, where the various elements are set in place. And so what, what David is saying is, my experience matches the Bible. My experience matches the writings of Moses. My experience strikes me with what God has done. Eric already read day one of the creation account. We'll read its parallel in day four, Genesis 1, 14 to 19. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let, there be sign let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens and give light to the earth. And it was so, and God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them, there it is, God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light to the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and it was evening and there was morning, day four. And when you look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, as David was a shepherd boy, rural first century Palestine, he saw a lot of star-filled nights. A few years ago, we were at Bryce Canyon, and I was too lazy to go back out there. It's famous for being one of the dark places in, uh, in the United States where there's no towns anywhere close to the park, and so there's no you know, filtered light coming out to sort of wreck your view when you look up. So if you go out there late at night, you get pretty high, too. You're seven, 8,000 feet high. And so you just get these really spectacular views of the sky. Um, I was too sleepy. It was dumb. Um, but David, David, he had a 1,000 Bryce Canyon nights. Thousands of them. I mean, for who knows how many years he shepherded his father's sheep and sat out at night under the stars. Um, and he looks at the heavens, the work of God's fingers, and he, he simply sees them there. And he knows this isn't just somebody made it. This is, see, David believes that the God of Genesis made it. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made it. Uh, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we would say, made it. Our pastoral prayer this morning was uh, built off of uh, Psalm 98. Uh, next, next month, we'll, we'll take a, we always take a road trip on vacation and generally go west. The last few years have been a little disappointing because really bad fire season. So my 
Um, I, I really love the drive across Montana, 560 miles of, of, of Montana. But at you, as you, uh, as 90 meets 94 at Billings, uh, 90 also comes down into the um, Yellowstone River Basin. And so you follow the Yellowstone River for about 150 miles. You're just following the Yellowstone River. Uh, and then it eventually cuts to the south sharply into the park. And then you go up over another pass and then you come down into Butte, Montana and you go by Butte a ways and suddenly you pick up the Clark Fork River. And then you follow the Clark Fork River for about 100 miles. And in this case, you cross over it, I don't know how many times, it just keeps crossing over and crossing back over the Clark Fork River, uh, 9094 does, uh, and almost until you get to uh, St. Regis. Um, and, and then all around you, all around you are mountains the whole way. It's a little like you know, driving 560 miles through an oil painting uh, with these mountains and rivers by your side the whole, the whole way. Um, and, and here's how the psalmist describes this at the end of Psalm 98. He says this, the rivers clap their hands and the mountains sing for joy together before the Lord in the presence of God. The rivers, the rivers are worshiping God. They're clapping their hands. Mountains are singing. Which is why we feel what we feel when we're in the combination of rivers and, and mountains. Um, you get out... This year, again, we'll be right on the Skykomish River in the Cascade Mountains. So get up in the morning, get your Bible out, go out there, and there's, there's right off your deck is the Skykomish River, and the Cascade Mountains are on the horizon all around you, and, and the river's clapping its hands, and the mountain is singing. But in Psalm 98, this is where this beautiful picture turns ominous to a culture like ours. Here's what he goes on to say. Let the rivers clap their hands and the mountains sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. We live in a culture where people regularly say things like this now. I won't worship a God who would say X is wrong. I just canceled that God. He's out. He's out. Out on him. We think we can do that. We are really that dumb. We think we can do that. We think reality is whatever we want it to be. We really do. That's our official position. Said, no, 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 no. You could, no one could believe that. We believe that. We believe that. We just cancel him. We just, and we assure one another, oh, no, 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 don't worry about that. We wouldn't have a God who judges according to righteousness, the righteousness as it's laid out in the Bible. We're not going to put up with that. We're not. We're not. God's Twitter account, gone. Not going to have it. 
He's out. He's out. No more influence for him. David's warning us. David's warning us that God that you hear being praised by the river and being sung to by the mountains, he's really there. And he's coming at the end to judge the world, to judge the peoples. And you're going to deal with them. And the only way to be ready to deal with them is his son, Jesus Christ. So that's the heart of the Christian message. How could I be ready to deal with that God? One way and one way only. Through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ under the forgiveness of your sins, that's the only way to be ready. The only possible way to be ready for this God, given our lives. And we know it. We know he's there. We can't miss it. We'll be reminded that he's there as soon as we walk back outside. Really, even as we just look around and see all these people created in this image, we know he's there. There are no accidental people. There's no accidental universes. There's, this, there's not. There's God. There's God, and we're dealing with him. And the only safe way is through Jesus Christ. Be sure you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's no other safe way to be, no other safe way to live. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your words to us. Thank you for giving us the psalmist David. We thank you for the privilege of singing praises to you. And in that sense, mirroring and reflecting the very nature of the universe as the mountains sing to you, as the rivers clap their hands. And as we add our voices Accept our praise and our thanksgiving. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.